Right, good afternoon everybody. Today I'm joined by the Director of Public Health, Dr Caroline McElnay, who will provide uh, today's cases update. After that I'm going to talk about masks on public transport. Um, from next Monday, the 31st of August, the uh, masks will become compulsory on public transport. I'll set out the details of that. I'm also going to uh, provide a, a few comments on the just released report from the Independent Contact Tracing Assurance Committee uh, and the response on that from the Ministry of Health. But first, let's get today's update. Thank you, Minister. Tēnā koutou katoa. There are seven new confirmed cases of COVID-19 to report in New Zealand today. One is an imported case, a woman in her 20s who arrived in New Zealand on August 22nd from Turkey via London and Hong Kong. She has been staying in a MIQ at the Sedima in Christchurch, tested positive for COVID-19 around day three of her time in managed isolation. The other six cases are in the community and they have all been linked to the Auckland cluster. Five cases are household contacts of previously reported cases, and one is linked via their workplace. One of the new cases is a student at Mount Albert Grammar School, and Auckland Regional Public Health are currently working with the school, community, and the Ministry of Education. The student has not been at school since the 12th of August. By this morning, our contact tracing team had identified 2,455 close contacts of cases, of which 2,404 have been contacted and are self-isolating, and we're in the process of contacting the rest. There are 159 people linked to the community cluster at the um, Auckland, currently at the Auckland quarantine facility. This includes 85 people who have tested positive for COVID-19 and their household contacts. Just an update on those in hospital. Today we have 10 people in hospital with COVID-19. Two people are in Auckland City Hospital. Four people are in Middlemore. Three people are at North Shore Hospital. And one person is in Waikato Hospital. Eight of those people are on a ward and one person is in Middlemore is in ICU, as is one person in North Shore. 15 people are now considered to have recovered from COVID-19, which brings the number of active cases in New Zealand to 126, of which 11 are imported cases. Our total number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 is now 1,351, which is the number we report to WHO. Yesterday, our laboratories processed 9,257 tests for COVID-19, which brings the total number of tests completed to date to 719,320. And just finally, an update on the Mount Roscoe Evangelical Fellowship Church cluster that we um, talked about yesterday. There are now eight people associated um, with the church who have tested positive for COVID-19. All eight cases have epidemiological links to each other and they attended common events. Three of those cases have been genomically linked to the Auckland community cluster. We are still investigating the epidemiological link to the main cluster. We'd just like to reiterate what was um, announced yesterday, that anyone who attended the following events should get tested as soon as possible. So services held at the church in Stoddard Road on the 8th, 9th or 11th of August, and a wedding that was held at the church on Friday the 7th of August. Anyone who attended these events and who is currently unwell or has experienced any signs of COVID-19 in the past two weeks should contact Healthline 0800 358 5453 and let them know that you attended one of these events and they'll provide further advice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McElnay. The world keeps learning about this pandemic and as we continue to learn, we continue to adapt our own practice in New Zealand based on the latest advice and evidence. On Monday, the Prime Minister announced that face coverings will become mandatory on public transport throughout the country when we are at COVID alert level two and above. 
that requirement will come into force on Monday the 31st of August uh, when Auckland moves down from Alert Level 3 to join the rest of the country. Under Section 11 of the COVID-19 Public Health Response Act, I'll be signing a new order this afternoon that sets out how this is going to work in practice. I want to emphasise from the outset that face coverings are an added layer of protection in close environments. Maintaining physical distancing is still the best mechanism. We also know that some people won't be able to wear masks, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So from Monday, face coverings should be worn on public transport and aircraft. That includes trains, buses and ferries. They do not need to be worn on school buses, uh, on charter and group tours, on inter-island ferries or on private flights, or by private contractors of air services such as top dressers. These groups are already likely to be within each other's bubbles uh, as part of a registered group or have space to physically distance, for example, on the inter-island ferries. In addition, face coverings do not need to be worn by passengers of small passenger vehicles, such as taxis or Uber, but the drivers will be required to wear masks. People under 12 years of age will be exempt in line with World Health Organisation guidance. People with a disability or physical or mental condition that makes covering their face unsuitable uh, will also not have to wear a mask. There'll be other times when it's not required, for example, in an emergency or where it's unsafe, if people need to prove their identity uh, or if they're communicating with someone who is deaf or required by law. Uh, we do not have a mask wearing culture here in New Zealand. This is going to take us all some time to get used to. And so we do ask for patience and cooperation uh, as we all get used to taking this additional protective step. What we're asking is for people to wear a face covering just as you would buckle up when you get into a car. Whilst a breach of this requirement without reasonable excuse could uh, could be uh, subject to an infringement of up to $300 or a fine imposed by a court of up to $1,000. In the early stages of this, we do ask people to be kind and cooperative with one another while we all get used to this, these new requirements. Guidance will be going out to all transport operators on the requirements under Alert Level 2, including those around physical distancing, cleaning, QR codes, and of course, face coverings. We do ask that people respect drivers and transport operators. They're not obliged to refuse people entry, given that people will have legitimate reasons for not wearing a mask, and I've just gone through those. But drivers will be encouraged where possible and where they are comfortable to ask passengers to wear a mask. Now is a good time for all New Zealanders to get themselves a mask or a supply of masks. We are releasing three million further masks from the national... Uh, store for national distribution over coming days as a one-off boost to the immediate supply that's available. This will be distributed amongst iwi, social services groups and community food banks and centres in regions where there is public transport. Uh, you can also make your own and there's guidance on the internet on how to do so and would encourage people in particular to have a stock of reusable masks so that you can wash them uh, between uses. Uh, face coverings can be anything that covers your mouth and nose. That can include scarves and adapted T-shirts. To supplies of disposable masks uh, are continuing to be distributed throughout the country. Uh, moving on to the uh, Roach report that's being released today. Uh, we are releasing the final report of the Contact Tracing Assurance Committee, uh, the CTAC report, and the Ministries of Ministry of Health's response to that. The committee was tasked with reviewing progress against the recommendations of Aisha Verrill's earlier report. The report concludes that New Zealand uh, is now in an increasingly strong position and that we do have a much improved contact tracing regime. There are work-ons, including scenario planning and system stress testing recommended in the report. The Ministry was in the final play stages of planning for this, uh, but of course we then had that overtaken by real life events uh, and the need to respond to the uh, needs uh, associated with this current cluster. So more than two weeks on, we can see how the system has responded to an actual event and it has responded well. As of yesterday, 
Our teams had identified 2,422 close contacts of cases, of which 2,368 had been isolated. That's a very high strike rate. Strike rate. Uh, and while the figures do vary from day to day, the teams are consistently performing around the benchmark of 80% of close contacts uh, identified and contacted within 48 hours. There are now about 1,500 people uh, using the National Contact Tracing Centre for the purpose of supporting contact tracing. Uh, this, um, and that excludes the management and supervisory roles who will also have access to it. Another major recommendation in the report was around the use of technology. Uh, and you will note that uh, over recent weeks, we've continued to improve the COVID-19 Contact Tracer app um, with additional functionality. Uh, and we have made the display of QR codes mandatory, the most recent change to that being uh, making QR codes mandatory on public transport. Trials are also in train for new Bluetooth uh, technology, including uh, potential COVID card and other smart uh, phone based Bluetooth solutions. There are other important uh, areas that have been identified for improvement in the report, uh, but they're beyond the scope of the contact tracing teams alone, uh, and they're being considered separately. But overall, I am very encouraged by the way our contact tracing processes are working uh, within, uh, in operating around this current cluster. The Ministry is innovating and it is responding quickly, uh, and I expect this culture of con continual improvement uh, will, of course, go on as we continue to learn and adapt. And with that, happy to open up for questions. Yes. We've now only got three days before Auckland is set to go down to level two. With these high numbers, are you starting to feel nervous about whether that can happen or not? No, because they're all still within the identified clusters, um, or cluster, but you know, they're within the within the identified contacts. So we know what we're dealing with, we know roughly the size of what we're dealing with, um, and that's very helpful. On current modelling though, when will we start to get to those zero and low case numbers that you would like to see? Uh, it could be another sort of week to 10 days before we start to see the numbers dropping off again. Um, again, one of the things that we'll be monitoring very closely, um, as we do, um, is whether there are any additional cases that are coming up outside, you know, a significant number of cases coming up outside of the identified cluster. Shouldn't we have been doing that by now, though? Oh, we, I mean, we're monitoring it every day. I mean, are you saying should... should we? Shouldn't those numbers have been dropping away by now, though? Because on modelling earlier in the week, we were expecting to get some low case numbers. I mean, seven's, seven's a, a hand, more than a handful of people. I mean, one of the things that you'll see is that there are a couple of events that have potentially added significantly to our, to our overall case numbers. Um, and, of course, we are also doing now... We're going through... Um, the, the day 12 sweep. So people who were tested early on are being tested again around day 12 um, because that, that fits in with our practice. Um, and that, that is throwing up a few new cases, but there are already people that we knew um, that already been tested once. They're being tested again out of caution. Um, and I think that, that's where you're seeing some of those numbers coming through now. So just back on... Um the earlier, the earlier point there. Do you, do you think that we need to hit zero before we move? No, we don't. Um, and, and that was actually one of the things that Cabinet considered. You know, um, uh, what we need to know is that um, we have the, cu the cluster reasonably well contained uh, and we are reasonably confident of that in the sense that you know, the new cases we're seeing are within the cluster that, that's already been contact traced and identified. How concerning is it that that second mini cluster appears to be growing though? Um, Given that it's, it's, it's got the contacts around it have been identified and isolated, um, and so we will reach the point where that shouldn't be spreading further. We're not going to reach that point immediately, but we should reach that point. Are you concerned uh, that that cluster may be much bigger than we've picked up because it, you can't find that epidemiological link? Well, we'd like to be able to demonstrate a link to the cluster, and a lot of the testing that we're doing around that cluster is for that purpose. It's actually looking further back in time to see if we can identify a source for this cluster. And as um, Minister says, the cases that we've got with that cluster are close contacts of each other. Um, we will see as we get the, um, the further test results coming through from the um, testing that's been done through the church whether there are any other cases. Um, we can only um, hope that that is the case, but we do, we would feel happier if we were able to show what the link is from a person-to-person -person perspective, 
with the large cluster. Um, yeah. The best analogy that I've used, and you will have heard me use it here before, is it's like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle, and each new positive case is another piece of the jigsaw puzzle, and it helps to show how the cases are linked. And so there are still some gaps on the jigsaw board at the moment, and each new positive case that we get helps us to fill in another gap. It's I'll let you finish that question. Sorry, question. it's a different question. Okay. But last week you said you'd um, issue a new order clarifying the requirements for airline crew coming back from overseas. Have you issued that order yet and what are the requirements? No, I haven't. We're still in conversations with the airlines about that. I'm meeting with Air New Zealand again this afternoon. Um, obviously, you will have seen the, um, the material that Air New Zealand released last week um, identifying what their infection prevention and control measures are, the extra things that they are doing to, to keep the public safe. One of the things that we do not want to do is end up with no airlines flying in and out of New Zealand. It's vital that we um, have a really good, robust regime that allows the airlines to continue to operate, and that's what we're working through with them. Isn't it more important to make sure that they're doing that safely? Why haven't you issued that new order? We need to do both, um, and I'm absolutely confident that the, the regime that we are working up with them is, is very, very robust. There is There are good protections in place now, but we're just looking at how we can make them even better. Just, just, back on, sure. just back on Sir Brian's report, a couple of things you didn't mention which require urgent action. Very active cross-government approach and clarity of accountabilities and decision-making. These aren't small fry things. Why is it so far down the track and this stuff hasn't been sorted? Uh, look, no, that, that's not true to say that it hasn't been sorted. Uh, I think what you've seen in this um, particular um, exercise that we've been going through now, um, that a lot of that has improved you know, hugely since the first time we had to do contact tracing. There are much more streamlined whole of government processes getting in behind and supporting contact tracing. The contact tracing centres are working very closely with other government departments who also have access to information, for example. The lines of decision making are, are much more clear. Um, the Ministry of Health has been working to make sure that our public health units are operating on a on a coordinated nationwide basis rather than in isolated silos. So that work, a lot of progress has been made in that area. Yeah, so far improved, then why would Sir Brian be putting them in the camp of urgently need action? Um, bear in mind that this report was several weeks ago. So uh, continued work has, has been done. This has been an iterative process, uh, and continued work has been done since that report was, was written. And in your mind, does a lot of this stuff come back to communication? Uh, yes, I mean, ultimately, contact tracing is a communication exercise. Um, and so, you know, in a, in a situation like this where you're trying to assemble quite a lot of information as fast as you possibly can, communication is critical. If you go back to the report that Megan Woods and um, Digby Webb did at that time, which is months ago now, uh, E-Commodore Webb said that communication was the biggest failure out of that report and that was what needed fixing. But it seems as if these things that require urgent attention are still in the communication camp. So why aren't people speaking to each other and sorting this stuff out? Well, no, I, I reject that. Like I said, that this report um, from uh, Brian Roach was several weeks ago now. Um, and actually, a lot of work, a lot of work has happened since then. So um, you'll see that you know the system is continuously improving, um, and ultimately, the results are the thing that we're, we've got to focus on here. And the results here are actually very good. Well, communication was cases. also an issue like uh, a couple of weeks ago over the testing of the border facing workers, when your strategy, cabinet strategy, was quite different from the ministry strategy. So those, those issues are, are still quite recent. Now. Um, look, I think um, we've canvassed those issues around testing um, very extensively in these uh, forums. Um, but but I, think the, I think the communication is improving day on day. Um, and ultimately, this is a people-driven system. Um, our contact tracing system is driven by people, um, and it relies on information being extracted from people, i.e. the contacts and the, and the, the, the cases and their contacts. And so um, communication is always, we're always looking at how we can improve those communication channels and I think that, you know, they've made very good progress in that regard. Yes. Why, can you just further expand on why the exemption for taxis and Ubers and small passenger vehicles in terms of the requirement for mask wearing? Um, because you, uh, there's, there's a variety of factors that we considered here. We considered the risk to those uh, individual businesses in, the, in many cases, but we also considered what the public health risk was. And the overall advice that was presented was that the, the minor public health protection gain that would be made from um, getting people to wear masks in that uh, setting were actually offset by the potential downsides for the, for the operators concerned. Um, and it would be very, very difficult for them to enforce. So um, if you look at the public health gain, people typically, when you're getting into um, you know, a, a taxi or an Uber, um, you're not sitting next to people that you don't know, um, other than the driver who'll be wearing a mask. Um, QR codes will be there, so we will be able to trace who's been in which taxis and, and which Ubers and when. 
Um, and it's, it's that smaller group size um, that, uh, of course, provides the, the greatest protection. But um, people are encouraged to wear masks. They just won't be mandatory in taxis and Ubers. I have a question. Just, um, international seafarers, will they be required to be tested upon um, entry into New Zealand uh, before, or, yeah, tested before or when they arrive in New Zealand? So what, um, what I'm, I'm, we're looking again at whether there can be further improvements made there, bearing in mind that if, you, if you're arriving and you're coming into New Zealand, you'll have to be tested and you're subject to our MI, uh, managed isolation and quarantine arrangements. Uh, the vast majority of people coming in on cargo ships, for example, don't actually enter New Zealand. They stay at the port. Most of them won't even get off the vessel at all. Um, and so we're, we're working through to make sure that the infection prevention and control uh, piece of that is as stringent and strong as possible. Uh, a few further refinements to that system have been identified, and I've um, given the tick for, the, for them to be uh, implemented. Um, so, but, you know, the, the issue around testing... Um, is still one that we're working through, bearing in mind that these people don't actually come into New Zealand. Are you, are you looking at any provisions? You know, there's some serious welfare issues, um, keeping these people in boats all the time, not letting them cross you know, through the port. Are you working on anything that would allow them um, more ease of access to, to New Zealand, to you know, food supplies, all of that? Most of the ships that come into New Zealand aren't actually here for very long, so um, they are, you know... The, the workforces that we're talking about are, are well used to not stopping in New Zealand. Um, you know, they're, they're used to in and out, of being in and out. Um, there, there is... To leave the ship, right? There is provision for people to leave the ship and come through our managed isolation and quarantine. There is also provision for people to leave the ship and immediately return home, because obviously there's crew changes that need to happen with these ships, um, and we've got provisions in place that allow that to happen. How, Can big, you uh, how many, close, how many um, close contacts there are in that uh, Ross school circle? Just three church services and one wedding, that's potentially hundreds. Uh, do you know how many there are and how many of them have been tested? Well, the uh, investigation into the church service and the wedding is historic, and that's part of the investigation into the source for the current case cases that we've seen at Mount Roskill. The actual containment itself uh, is looking very good. There's eight cases uh, reported. They've all been uh, close connections to each other. Uh, we will know as we get more of the test results back on the immediate, other immediate contacts who've been tested. But those particular events that I've mentioned are as an example of how we're trying to see what the link might be with this cluster and events that we knew that happened in the past and um, ideally, we would be able to identify someone who could then connect with the community cluster. Sorry, my question, my question was, about, was about how many of those close, close contacts have been identified related to those three church services and that wedding? How many have been identified and how many of them do you know have been tested? I don't know, I don't know how many of them have actually been tested, um, but they are being um, followed up by... Um, one of our other public health units, and that communicate that they're working through those numbers. We, we, I'm, just, I'm sure we can get yeah. you the number. We don't have the number here, but I'm sure yeah. we can get you that number. We collect those numbers. Um, some yes, questions we'll about um, the enforcement with the public transport. So can you tell me how it will work with those fines and what part police will play? Will they wait at bus stops, or how is that going to work? No, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's very similar to wearing a seatbelt. You know, like we don't have uh, police stopping every car to make sure someone's wearing a seatbelt, and we won't be stopping everybody coming on and off a bus to make sure they're wearing a mask either. Um, we are asking New Zealanders to comply with this. Um, we are asking for goodwill. The advice, that, you know, the evidence that we've seen so far suggests that people are actually ready to embrace these new rules, and there's a lot of compliance already, um, which is very heartening and very welcome. But we're not going to be putting police officers on every second street corner to make sure that people are wearing their masks. Public transport, there are many people who don't use apps but use public transport. If they haven't registered their hop card, which many don't, how do you plan to track those people? That's one of the reasons that we're now putting the QR codes um, on, onto the uh, onto yes. public transport, and we encourage people to you know to register their hop cards. There are other ways. Um, if we end up needing to contact trace you know someone on public transport, they haven't scanned their QR code um, and they haven't uh, registered their hop card. As long as we know what bus they were on um, and what time they were on that bus. How would you know how would you know who to contact if you do find someone on that bus? Well, because most of the other people on the bus uh, will have registered their um, their hop card or be scanning the QR code. Okay, for instance, I get on a bus, Jess gets on the bus, Jess tests positive and has a scan. I don't have a scan, I don't have a hop card. How do you find me? 
Uh, that's, we do that through public notifications, which we have done, uh, you would note, in, in some instances through here, we have been notifying public mm -hmm. events where that um, assembling of the detailed list uh, is more difficult. Mm -hmm. But we're certainly trying to make it as easy as possible um, for people to record their movements so that they can be notified when they, are, when they have been in a situation where they're at greater risk. Well, well, Minister, um, if these cases aren't epidemiologically linked um, you know, by the end of this weekend, should Auckland still move down alert levels? Um, look, I, I will ask um, uh, Dr McElnay to comment on that, but we did run through all of this uh, when, we, when we made the decision around the right timing to move down the alert levels, um, and we did make that decision conscious of the fact that we may still be seeing positive cases um, at the end of, you know, as we move down to alert level two. The, the key piece of information that we are monitoring very, very closely um, is whether they are all still linked to the, you know, the circle of contacts um, that we've been identifying. And at the moment, moment they still are. But you have no idea of the link, the chains, the links in the chains of transmission, so you haven't seen links of, you don't know where those, uh, how many other people those missing links have been um, infecting. Look, that's part of, the why, part of the reason that we ask all close contacts to isolate, um, because as long as they are isolating, um, then if they subsequently show up as a positive contact, it doesn't create a lot of extra concern for us because we know that they've been isolating. But again, I'll ask um, mm. Dr McElnay mm. to comment mm. on that. Um, we, have, uh, we have a very, um, very small number that we can't epidemiologically link to the cluster, and we've talked about the, the Mount Roskill one, um, and we have got another situation of just one individual. Um, we don't need necessarily to be able to, sh to sh demonstrate that link in order to be able to say that the particular cluster is contained, and we've got examples um, previously um, when we were in our first wave where we weren't able to make that link back to a source, but we were able to contain and have confidence that the cluster had been contained. In the two weeks in that case where you know you had restricted movement so there was less movement going on but in this case if they move down alert levels you won't really have those restrictions well it's also one of the reasons why we're um promoting testing and widespread testing in the auckland area because that will allow us to detect any previously undetected cases and that's part of the the whole strategy which will provide information to give us better understanding of what's actually happening just on the report, it says ongoing attention required to ensure contact testing system is reflective of Māori and Pacific needs. What are the, what do you believe those needs are, and what does a equitable tracking system look like? Tracing system look like that would get your tick of approval. I mean, one of the things that we know from the um, uh, current cluster is that. Uh, uh, we can do better at providing um, uh, opportunities for people to record their movements and record who they're coming into contact with. So there hasn't been as high a use of the COVID tracer app amongst the group that we've been dealing with uh, to what we would have liked. And in fact, um, you know, we've seen a significant uptake in usage of that since then. So that helps us. But in terms of uh, culture, obviously we want to try and make sure that um, we're making this system an inclusive, um, respectful one. Um, and that includes considering the, the, the demographics of the cluster that we're dealing with. So what does that look like? Like, what does an inclusive tracing app look like? Well, I mean, I think the app is, um, it, it's encouraging the uptake of the app is, is what we've been focused on here. But in terms of the specifics of contact tracing, of course, we have Māori and Pacific people involved in the contact tracing process. We've been working very closely with community organisations um, that, that are active in the Māori and Pacific community. I don't know whether uh, Dr McElnay wants to add to that, but um, I think there has been a real desire to make sure uh, that this is a, a very inclusive um, system. Um, I, I think we've certainly seen that with the uh, approach in this current outbreak, the um, communication and the links, particularly with communities in Auckland, Māori and Pacific communities, uh, that that helps um, understanding um, around what's what is what what the questions are that are being asked and the. Um, any answering any queries that people have about the disease and also about the need for self-isolation while we're under undergoing those initial tests. And that's been in invaluable in this particular cluster to have those teams at Auckland Regional Public Health 
able to have those conversations direct with individuals and also their community leaders. Okay, we'll come back over to the Ma Minister, Minister, to clarify, in terms of looking at the current restrictions again before Sunday, will Cabinet meet tomorrow to review that or on Saturday over the weekend? Uh, no, there are, there's no plans currently to review um, whether or not the decision that we've already made should go ahead. Um, we would do that if we got some evidence that suggested that we needed to somehow change course. Uh, at this point, we haven't seen any evidence that suggests we need to change course. And just a question from a colleague. Is there any consideration for a second quarantine hotel in Auckland because people from the community and the border are now staying at the jet park? At the moment, we can accommodate you know, what we need to accommodate within the jet park. Of course, if we need to stand up additional quarantine, then we have the ability to do that. Uh, Minister, with your education hat on, how did the Green School get $1.7 million worth of funding? It was a shovel-ready project, so it wasn't considered through the usual education capital um, spend route. Um, it was considered as a shovel-ready project, so the criteria for that were different. Um, the criteria for that looked uh, looked at the, you know, is it a building project? Yes. Is it ready to go? Yes. Um, can it be done quickly? Yes. Um, and it was funded through that. It's putting, a lot millions, of other schools it's putting millions of dollars into a private green school really a good use of public funds? Uh, look, ultimately, you know, um, that was something that the, the Green Party advocated quite strongly for, um, and so uh, it was it was one of their wins, if you like, out of the, the shovel-ready project um, uh, area, and so that's a question for them. Are you, you happy with that, the funding? Uh, look, it's not necessarily a project that I would have prioritised. Is there an element of hypocrisy from the government number, on this um, given? For funding, uh, sorry, for um, testing that you... Yes. have been aiming for. Are you 100% confident that you're going to hit that target just because in the last couple of days we haven't managed to get to the 7,000 number in Auckland and then with the weekend coming we also know that testing goes down over the weekend? Yeah, so we've been sitting just below the 10,000 overall number of tests across the country. We, we are in the process, as you know, of standing up additional testing um, centres and, and, and doing more work in that area. Um, and that takes a day or two to flow through into the number of test results that we, that we see. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll keep pushing it. You know, we, we, the 10,000 is our goal. So we, we're going to continue to... 10,000 average, uh, we're going to continue to push that. Well, well, minister, just back to the, um, the green school thing. Um, can you see how for, like, some um, principals at low decile schools, um, the, that, that amount of funding going to a school like that seems galling? Yes, I can. And I'll just remind you, it's not education funding that's going to that. Yes. Do, you, do you accept that there's an element of hypocrisy from your government on that? Do you accept that there's an element of hypocrisy from your government here because you rallied so hard against charter schools and now you're pumping millions into private schooling? Well, look, I said that's not, as I said at the beginning, that it's not uh, education funding that's going into that. It's a shovel-ready yes. project. Um, and really, that's a question for the ministers who are involved in the shovel-ready project process. So, um, just to come back to Sir Brian's report, given that you say we can't take it at face value because it was a couple of weeks ago and things have moved on, can you give me one or two examples in that sort of all-of-government approach, communication approach, where you've fundamentally changed something in the last couple of weeks that has made that system better, and what is it? Yeah, we do have one person now based in Auckland um, who is leading the overall public health response um, around contact tracing. Um, so that is, you know, a, a, an advance. It's basically about, you know, straightening up and, and clearing those lines of accountability, and that, is, um, that has been happening. So... Um, and the, the way the All of Government group are operating around supporting contact tracing is also tightened up as well. Um, we now have a, a much more streamlined process for how we consider the, the, um, the new case numbers every day um, to make sure that all of the arms of government that need to be connected into that process are connected into that process. Um, so I'm, I'm confident that it is operating in a much more streamlined way than it, it did uh, previously. You're happy to stop on that. You're happy that it's taken the last two weeks, given all of the stuff was raised in that report into quarantine and managed isolation months ago. You're happy that it's only taken the last two weeks for those fundamental changes to kick in? Well, no, no. I mean, I think you've got to bear in mind here that up until two weeks ago, it was a hypothetical system. So, you know, we, we're talking about, you know, we did have a few, you know, practice runs planned. We were going to stress test the system in a hypothetical sense. We've ended up stress testing the system in a live, real-time scenario. Um, but actually, you know, up until you get... A, 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 at the border before a, now. You up and, the open well, no, no, this is the contact tracing system. So up until you get a real live group of cases that need to be contact traced... Um, then, then actually, you know, the system is all hypothetical. Bearing in mind the contact tracing for those in Man 
managed isolation and quarantine typically will only involve one or two contacts, if any, because these are people that are coming directly off planes and going straight into a, a, an isolated hotel room. Uh, uh, Minister, to... one of the fears that we had from the first outbreak as a Pacifica community was that if it got into the Pacifica community, particularly in South Auckland, was that it would spread like wildfire. It is now this one based in the South Auckland community. Is it? Has it been as difficult? Is it a, a typical case compared to the previous clusters because of the way we live as a, as a community closely and within the, 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 the church setting? So, I mean, I can only give you my observations based on this cluster because I wasn't as intricately involved in the previous um, uh, round of cases that New Zealand dealt with. Um, the Pacific community have been incredibly helpful. Um, they've um, been subject to much higher rates of testing per capita than other population groups around the country. They're wanting to do the right thing and go out and get their tests. They're saying yes to the test in far greater numbers than others, um, and that's been really, really helpful. Um, we do know that you know church settings, and we've got some some uh, some some groups that are associated with church settings are one of the areas where we've always been aware uh, that there could be risk of transmission in those kind of settings. And that's why you see it at alert level three. I mean, even as we transition down, we still have um, limitations on the size of gatherings because in those gatherings, that's where we can see that, that very quick spread. But I'll, uh, in terms of the comparing it to the last time around, I'll ask uh, Dr McElnay to comment on that. Uh, thank you. Um, last time we didn't see many cases in uh, Pacific communities, but that's certainly something that we've always been m mindful of. Uh, this time, um, we know a lot more about the virus and we know about how it transmits. And so we do know that um, you're particularly um, uh, more vulnerable when you've got a close um, household transmission. Uh, the um, um, supporting families who are in self-isolation is something that we've uh, planned for and been able to roll out, but then also supporting people who are cases um, uh, and their uh, contacts is also something that we've, we've been able to put in place uh, to support them. Uh, so it has been different certainly, to the first time. Um, and the, just to reiterate what the Minister says, the, the, the support from the Pacific community has been tremendous. Okay, we'll come to the far, far corner. Yeah. I'm just looking at those disease indicators that you've sent out. It seems like what's at the root of some of the biggest falls beneath what your target um, threshold is, is that people are taking so long between displaying their first symptom and actually getting a test. And the flow-on effect from that um, are you confident that that is a situation that's, that's changing? Yeah, so what you'll see in those, those are the first 10 days of, of numbers from this current cluster that we've been grappling with. Um, and, of course, in the early part of that, those numbers weren't looking particularly good at all because, you know, we many of those, many people would uh, fall outside the desired time frame because um, their first signs of infection were before we even knew that we were dealing with another um, another cluster. Um, and so what I can say is that as the days have gone on, those numbers have tightened up and got significantly better. So in the next wave of numbers that we will release, you'll see those numbers looking better. The other thing that I've just been probing into um, over the last sort of 24 to 48 hours is that the managed isolation and quarantine numbers don't look particularly good on some of those metrics because uh, often the um, point of infection will have been well before the person even arrived in New Zealand. Um, and so that will bring those numbers down as well. So as we see um, a higher proportion of the cases we're dealing with outside of managed isolation um, and in the known cluster, which we've been working on for some time, those numbers will start to, to look better and they already are starting to look better. So, But we've given you the full 10 days. I can tell you that on, on a day-by-day -day breakdown, the early days were the ones that didn't look so good um, and they started looking better as those 10 days went along and then you'll see further improvement as the next wave of numbers is released. And again, um, if Dr McElnay wants to add mm. to that. Mm. Um, no, just completely support that. The, the first few cases, uh, there were a number of days um, that people had had symptoms, hadn't been tested. But once we were into the management of the cluster, um, we were seeing that people were actually either being, there was a very short window between symptom onset and testing, or what we've seen much more because of the close contacts is people are actually already in isolation and then they're, they're tested and so we've already got that security around them. So you would okay. see the change as the days go on. Yeah. Um, just on the CTAC report, why did it take so long to release it? The final report came through in 
16th of July. Yeah, look, we're intending to um, release it earlier than that. Obviously, the, the fact that we've been having to deal with this most recent uh, cluster um, is one of the... Um, caused a bit of a delay. We were intending, as I said, another one of the reasons for the delay was um, we were um, planning to stress test the system, um, which was one of the recommendations, um, and uh, we had a scenario there planned out, ready to go, and we were literally about sort of 24 hours away from hitting the go button on that, and we wanted to do that before we released the report recommending that it be done, um, and of course we ended up dealing with a real-life event instead. Um, so, uh, you know, it would have probably been released a couple of weeks back had we not been dealing with this current cluster. We're hearing from Aucklanders that there's some confusion about the testing criteria. Originally it was that if you have any symptoms, go and get tested, and then you spoke about asymptomatic testing as well yesterday. Are you able to clarify that? Um, yes. Um, if you're... Uh, Obviously, if, you, if you're showing symptoms, get a test. Please do. Uh, there'll also be tar more targeted testing of those who are asymptomatic in areas where we're needing to get our numbers up for that purposes of, of, of surveillance. Uh, there's obviously asymptomatic testing amongst close contacts or identified, even, even amongst some of the casual contacts. You'll see that as well um, as part of the investigation process and as part of just making sure we're containing the cluster. Um, and so not everybody across Auckland should uh, immediately run down to get a test if they're asymptomatic. Um, but if you're in those areas, those neighbourhoods where we've identified that we're, we're dealing with, um, with with events, for example, if you've been to those events or been connected with people who, are, who have been to those events, those are the sorts of people that you would expect to see more asymptomatic testing happen, happening uh, amongst that community. And Dr McElnay, can I just ask about the Mount Ross School Church Cluster? Um, three cases genomically linked to the original mm. cluster. Is it the working assumption that all eight cases then will be linked yes, there? Yes, that's right. That's right. You don't always have to do a, a genome sequence on every single case if you've already got a strong epidemiological link. Do you have any idea how possibly they, it could be linked back to that cluster? Or is it um, just... Is it just too hard to say at this point? Well, that's where there's very active in investigation uh, into how there might be a link or see if we can identify a link. As I said earlier, that's where some of these events that have happened in the past may have been um, a possible source. But at this stage, um, there's a, a number of leads that are being followed up. You mean like church services a couple of weeks before or something that's like right. that? That's right. That's yeah. right. Is there any suggestion or any um, indication that this new church cluster could have actually been started before the original, could, could the source have come from within this one? The, 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 um, the, the current church cluster, their onset dates are quite close together. So that's why we're thinking that there may have been a, a common event that um, some of those individuals have been exposed to, and then what we what we see, what we're seeing, as we've seen with other cases, is that you can get households in those cases then also become in, infected. Um, so at this point, um, at this point, we're just looking for further information mainly because we haven't identified, been able to clearly say what the epi link is between this cluster and the main cluster. At this moment, we're not, it, it doesn't look like this cluster is a source, I think that's what you're asking, for the, the main cluster. Right, we'll, do, we'll do one final round of questions, we'll start at the back. Those three church services and the wedding could be a very large number of people. Do you actually know who those people are? or are you relying on them to come forward, or, or worse, to get sick and then get tested? No, those individuals have been identified. There are, I think it's um, 400 at the wedding, 200 at the church services, and so those named individuals are being contacted by one of our other public health units. Okay, come down here. Um, back to the report, the system said it should identify and meet specific Māori and Pacifica needs, and an example given is alternative isolation arrangements is there any thoughts around that and what does that look like? Yes, and you will see that in the Tokoro um, case where we did have alternative uh, quarantine arrangements that we put in place for that specific community. Um, so we can you know, set up bespoke quarantine or isolation arrangements where we need to and um, where it's culturally appropriate to do that. Okay, uh, any last questions over here? Yes. Why not make masks uh, mandatory uh, for indoor environments like churches? Um, we haven't seen uh, advice that would suggest that that will help us hugely um, because 
as long as we people are in spaces where they're known, where they're coming into contact with known other contacts, um, then the masks aren't necessarily going to provide an additional layer of protection. That's the, the public health advice we've got at the moment. But um, I'll, 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 I'll invite the source of the I'll invite the source of the advice to to provide a comment on that. I think the. Uh the subtle, t the subtle message around the, the mask is actually linked to the alert levels. And so in alert level two, uh, there's, no, or there's no evidence of um, high levels of community transmission. And so the wearing of masks then becomes a precautionary preventive measure. And uh, particularly in uncontrolled environments, and as Minister was outlining earlier around some of the challenges with buses, a bus, a public bus is a, a clear example of where you've got that uncontrolled environment. And some of the other situations where um, our advice has been that um, masks should not be mandatory, it's because we're able to either identify those individuals or they're part of a bubble. And I think in, in the church settings in particular, that's where we're seeing with our uh, investigations that um, we can put in place other measures to protect individuals, physical distancing, and the ability to know who has been there and, and, and contact them, follow yeah, them there up. There are 100 people at level two, and they are strangers mixing and mingling in indoor settings. Surely that is a good level of layer of protection in a virus that is transmitted via air droplets. The um, masks um, are certainly um, an addition to all the other measures, all the other public health measures. And the particular question I think here was around the mandatory mask wearing. Our advice um, is um, supportive of wearing of wearing masks in, in a number of different situations, but the particular question is when do you make it mandatory? And that's been our rationale for why you would make it mandatory in a public bus setting as opposed to a church. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'm asking why, what, what well, is the difference wrap. between that and a public bus question. setting when you have people, strangers mixing and middling in an indoor setting at level two? Why not make well, it mandatory? At, level, exactly two, at, the same at level two, you have a very low level of community transmission. It's a different situation when you're at level three. The current um, advice around the masks in the, in the public um, bus is actually a highly precautionary approach. Yep. So would you encourage mask use at churches? At the moment, our advice has been that... Um, uh, there's no reason for people not to wear masks, but again, at alert level two, our advice has not been widespread mask wearing at alert level two. 